Now, today we're going to hear from Professor Tony Martin of Wellesley College in, in Boston about the origins of the slave trade in this country. Now, I'm sure he's not going to tell you this, but I'm going to say this. He has come under bitter attack more than once for the views that he holds. And you'll understand why when he starts to develop those views, probably. The Boston Globe, which is the major newspaper in that city, published a horrible attack on him about two months ago, written by a Jewish author. I presume he's Jewish, judging by the name. I beg your pardon? Yeah, a Jewish author. And I put it on my website so people can read it, but I simultaneously put on and linked to it the reply from a minister of the Nation of Islam, which is not a religion with which I have anything in common myself, I hasten to add, but the reply I published because it was so well-founded and it justified the professor in every degree and grade and at every level, in particular pointing out that the sources that Professor Martin has used in developing his history of the slave trade in this country are not extremist, they're not radical sources. They are mainline historians, mostly if not entirely Jewish historians who've taken a particular interest in this aspect, and so they can be relied on to have written the truth. Professor Tony Martin, I'm going to ask you now to tell the audience the history of the slave trade. Thank you very much, David Irving, for inviting me here to participate in this conference. It has been a very enjoyable experience so far. There's a real spirit that I have discerned here, a sort of a family spirit. You know, the, the atmosphere seems to be one of one big happy family. And um, even one who is a stranger to this particular gathering, like myself, has been able to get a sense of that spirit. So I thank you for your friendliness and I thank you for your kindness again in inviting me here. I would say uh, in the beginning that I endorse the notion of rare history, which is the notion, as far as I gather, that sort of pervades this conference. History, as I think everyone here will recognize, is perhaps the most contentious of all subjects. But the fact that history is a contentious subject, subject to varying interpretations, is no reason, I believe, to justify the effort which has become somewhat widespread in recent years to attempt to criminalize dissenting historical opinions, to either criminalize those opinions literally or sometimes to subject those who hold differing opinions to widespread vilification. So I endorse the notion then of real history. History is controversial, it is contentious, but differences of opinion, I think, in the historical profession ought to be debated, ought to be fought out in the broad arena of ideas, and hopefully in time the uh, correct ideas will prevail, hopefully, and incorrect ideas will uh, die. <clears throat> the topic which I hope to deal with today is the controversies, recent controversies, surrounding the question of the African slave trade. That is the slave trade in African people across the Atlantic Ocean. So that's the controversies which have arisen surrounding that question of the transatlantic slave trade. Slavery, as we know, has been historically an almost universal institution. I suspect that there must be very, very few societies that have not, at one time or another, experienced slavery. Karl Marx argued that slavery was one of the basic stages that Western European society went through after what he called primitive communism and preceding feudalism and so on. As one looks around the world at other societies, one sees examples of slavery just about every place. Slavery in ancient Greece is very well known. There's a very famous quotation from the Roman, the Roman uh, politician and man of letters, Cicero, in which he wrote to some friend of his one time, suggesting to that friend that when he went to buy slaves, that he should avoid buying English slaves because they were so uh, stupid, ignorant. 
he thought that a guy would be wasting his money. In fact, it's, it's very fascinating because the kinds of stereotypes that Cicero was putting forward in relation to English slaves were not that different from the kinds of stereotypes that developed later on pertaining to African slaves. So slavery then has been a very universal experience. Nevertheless, it has been a very controversial experience, and it continues to be a very controversial experience. One of the very first controversies surrounding slavery is the question of defining slavery. What precisely is slavery? A variety of different types of human condition have been described over the years as slavery. For example, serfdom in Europe has been described on occasion as being slavery. Sometimes when speaking of the African situation prior to the transatlantic slave trade, sometimes historians have used the expression domestic slavery to try to differentiate the kind of so-called slavery that existed on the African continent prior to the transatlantic slave trade with what eventually developed in the Americas and elsewhere. Domestic slavery is said to have been something akin to domestic servitude, where those who were slaves had a certain amount of, of social mobility and weren't necessarily subjected to the kind of harsh regime that developed in the Americas later on. We have the term slavery applied to what in some history books has come to be known as white slavery, the white slave trade. I believe it was 1910 in the United States of America when an act was passed against so-called white slavery, the Mann Act. I think it was 1910. And white slavery supposedly was a slave, not supposedly, it was a trade in women, many of whom apparently were Jewish women coming out of Central Europe, and a trade which, notwithstanding the fact that the uh, women were Jews, a trade which apparently was prosecuted by Jewish entrep uh, entrepreneurs, it was a, a global trade in which apparently women were sent from Europe across the world to act as prostitutes and so on. This was in the 19th century and into the early 20th century as well. So the term slavery has been applied to that situation, so-called white slavery, the white slave trade. There are many other controversies concerning slavery at all different periods in history. For example, there's a controversy which is raging right now concerning whether Jews were enslaved in ancient Egypt. You know, there's been a, a body of thought over the years relying on biblical sources and whatnot, suggesting, well, supposedly relying on, on biblical sources, suggesting that Jews were enslaved in ancient Egypt. There's another body of thought which argues that there's no real evidence for Jews having been enslaved in ancient Egypt. So that, that's another controversy which has arisen. There's a controversy concerning slave labor in Egypt period among indigenous ancient Egyptians. There's a, there's a body of thought that suggests that the pyramids of ancient Egypt were constructed by slave labor. There's a contrary body of thought which suggests that no, there, there was no slave labor. It was a question of, of peasants being used as construction workers at a time because of the inundation of the uh, Nile Valley at a time when you know, life was relatively slow, etc., etc. One of the biggest controversies concerning slavery arose in the context of the transatlantic slave trade on the question of the relationship between capitalism and slavery. In fact, that precise uh, phrase was the title of one of the um, outstanding books on the slave trade, Capitalism and Slavery, a book written by Eric Williams, a man who subsequently became Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And Eric Williams argued that the rise of, the of uh, capitalism in Europe and the Industrial Revolution more precisely in England in the late 1700s was a direct consequence, he argued, of the super profits, the unprecedented accumulation of capital that took place as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Williams attempted to document this thesis in very, very minute detail. Nevertheless, this has remained an area of great controversy, perhaps one of the greatest areas, areas of controversy around slavery and the slave trade. Was the slave trade the reason for the great accumulation of capital that made the Industrial Revolution possible in England and subsequently in the rest of Europe? Yet another of the great controversies that has arisen and that continues to rage around the question of slavery is the question of statistics pertaining to the African slave trade across the Atlantic. How many Africans perished in that slave trade? Estimates run anything from 8 or 9 million to 600 million. Black historians have tended to be 
on the, you know, the, 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 the larger side of those estimates, and other historians have often tended to be, on, on, you know, towards the more conservative estimates. I don't think anybody will ever know precisely how many people died. Suffice it to say that many died in Africa itself before they ever made it to a slave ship. Sometimes slaves were, were, were obtained as much as a thousand miles inland from the shore. And it, it was a very arduous journey from wherever slaves were obtained very often to the shore. Once they got to the shore areas, there sometimes was a, a period of waiting in harsh conditions, you know, while they awaited the arrival of a slave ship and so on. A conventional figure that we often see is that mortality across the Atlantic, that is during what they call the Middle Passage, the trip from West Africa to the Americas, it is said in many books that the mortality during that uh, Middle Passage was something like 33%. This in itself, I'm sure, is a figure that, that's subject to some controversy. But it is suggested very often that maybe one in three of each of those, of, of those Africans who was you know, embarked on a ship, a slave ship, on the West African coast was dead before they even arrived in the Americas. C.L.R. James, the man who has written a definitive history of the Haitian Revolution, C.L.R. James. C.L.R. James says in his famous book, The Black Jacobins, that the life expectancy for an African slave arriving in Haiti was six years. So those African slaves who survived that thousand miles or maybe less journey from the interior of Africa to the coast, and who then survived that trip from West Africa to the Americas, those were the most hardy of the Africans, the ones who were able to, to survive that arduous uh, experience. Once they got to Haiti, C.L.R. James suggests, they were dead, most of them within six years. The life expectancy was six years. He says that it was, um, from a purely economic perspective, it, it was better for the planters to work slaves literally to death in Haiti, literally to death, and then import new ones, rather than you know, keep them alive, treat them well, um, and then have to deal with diminishing returns as time went on, as they became older, as they became a charge on the plantation, as they were unable to work, etc. It is perhaps because of some of these controversies that the term chattel slavery has been uh, advanced by some historians in relation to the kind of slavery that developed in the Americas. Because the term slavery has come to cover so many types of situations, some historians have used the term chattel slavery to uh, describe slavery as it existed in our part of the world here in the Americas. Chattel, from the English word meaning cattle, chattel, I think cattle, indicating that human beings in this kind of slavery were treated like animals, like cattle, in a way that perhaps was not necessarily always present in slavery in other places. Perhaps that kind of debasement of the human spirit perhaps was not as prevalent perhaps in serfdom in Europe or maybe in domestic slavery in Africa, etc. So the term chattel slavery then is one reflection of an effort to come to grips with at least one aspect of these many controversies concerning the slave trade. Another controversy pertains to the question of what kind of institution slavery was in the Americas. Was it a benign institution? Were the slaves happy? Did they cry when their master died? You know, did, you know did, did they bow and scrape? Did they become Sambo characters? Sambo is a term that some historians have, have come up with to describe a kind of personality whereby Africans supposedly uh, acquiesce, I guess, in the institution of slavery. They, they like being subjected. They like being enslaved and so on. They, they became childlike, etc. So were they Sambos? Did they like slavery? Were they mostly rebellious? Was slavery a harsh institution? Was it a mild institution? All of these are areas around which controversy has raged. There's a historian back in the 1940s, a man called Tannenbaum, who put forward yet another controversial thesis. He argued that slavery was milder in the Portuguese and Spanish territories in the Americas than it was in the Protestant territories. He argued that the Portuguese in places like Brazil and the Spaniards and other places were prone to miscegenation. And as far as he was concerned, miscegenation was some kind of an indicator of mildness. My own argument is that nothing could be further from the truth. Miscegenation simply meant that, uh, that slave owners had access, sexual access, to their slave women and took advantage of that situation. But miscegenation outside of marriage is not, you know, ipso facto and per se evidence of anything except 
access to women who, who were defenseless. But nevertheless, you had a historian, Tannenbaum, arguing that there was a great deal of miscegenation, he said, in, in, in Latin America. I'm not even sure if he was correct in suggesting that there was more miscegenation in Brazil, say, than in the southern United States. And his very premise, I'm not sure if, 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 if it was correct. I, I doubt very much whether there could have been more miscegenation in Brazil or Cuba or someplace like that there was, than there was in New Orleans or Charleston, South Carolina. Maybe here in Hebron, Kentucky, who knows? I don't know much about Kentucky. Nevertheless, I mention this again just to, to, to give you a sort of a sense of how controversial a thing this question of slavery has been and will continue to be. Which brings me to the role of Jews in the African slave trade. I have been a teacher of black history for many years, 30 or more years. And of course, as a teacher of black history, one obviously has to be acquainted with the question of slavery and the slave trade. I never really considered myself a great specialist in the slave trade per se, even though I was acquainted with it in, in, a, in a general way. But of course, circumstances conspired to cause me to look closely at this aspect of black history, especially the question of Jews in the African slave trade. Now, the question of Jews in the African slave trade is one which I, despite the fact that I was a professor of African history for many years, is a question that I was only dimly aware of. I had come across a little reference someplace suggesting that there was a Jewish presence in the African slave trade. But now that I am more aware of, of the role that Jews played, it, it strikes me as very interesting that I could have taught African history and black history generally, African American history, Caribbean history for so long without having a clearer sense of the involvement of Jews in, in, in that nefarious trade. And it seems to me that as I look back on this reality, it seems to me that somewhere along the line there must have been a perhaps a deliberate tendency on the part of somebody, I'm not sure who, maybe book publishers, maybe historians themselves, but it seems as though there was a, a tendency over the years to downplay, to deliberately downplay and to obscure, to camouflage the role of Jews in the African slave trade. Now I, I realize that many of the people who I now know to, be, to have been Jews, who played a, you know, a, 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 an important role in the slave trade, were described in history books as just white or Portuguese or Spaniards or whatever. There was a tendency, and there still is a tendency, you know, whenever um, Jews were involved, if, if it was something concerning which Jews were proud, then that person would be identified as a Jew. If it was something that, that you know, that, uh, you know, concerning which Jews maybe felt that, you know, that it might cause a bad reflection on, on, that, on their kind, there was a tendency to sort of hide behind other people. So that Jewish racism would become white racism, or Jewish involvement in the slave trade would become Portuguese involvement, and so on. I had a very graphic demonstration of this shortly after my uh, controversy arose, when that Sunday morning program, The Week with David Brinkley, I think it's an ABC TV program, I believe. Well, you know, one of the more prestigious Sunday morning talk programs, David Brinkley, I suppose, is considered a very authoritative figure. But Amazingly to me, the question of the Jewish involvement in the slave trade was considered so important by, by these folks in the major media that they actually spent a segment one morning on the week with David Brinkley. This is around about 1994, I think, discussing um, me and the whole question of the Jewish involvement in the African slave trade. And uh, David Brinkley, and I, I, in my book, The Jewish Onslaught, I refer to this incident, and I, and I refer to, J to David Brinkley as speaking with the authority of the blissfully ignorant. And David Brinkley, with great authority, um, announced that Jews had nothing to do with the slave trade. He said, the Portuguese, yes, but not the Jews. You know, he said, Professor Martin at Wellesley College is insane, you know, and Koki Roberts said, oh, they should boycott his classes, he should be fired, and all kinds of things for saying that Jews were involved in the slave trade. But come to find out that many of these Portuguese that are, in fact, perhaps the majority of these Portuguese, you know, slave ship owners and so on, that David Brinkley would, was talking about were, in fact, Jews. Some were what they called Moranos, Jews who, who um, pretended to convert to Christianity, then declared their Jewishness at the first opportunity and so on. But, but here was just one of many examples where the Jewish presence in this trade tended to be camouflaged, you know, um, under other kinds of categorizations. <coughs> So then, I was just very, uh, only dimly aware then of this whole question of the Jewish involvement in the slave trade. 
until sometime around 1992 or thereabouts, I received a little postcard in the mail. It was a bulk mailing advertising a book published by the Nation of Islam's Historical Research Department. The book was entitled The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews. And I ordered the book and I read it. I was very impressed by it. And as a good professor, you know, I always try, despite the fact that I've taught for many years, but I always try to keep my students abreast of latest developments. So here was something that fascinated me, something that surprised me since I had been unaware of it. And I did what I always do in that situation, and that is I decided to incorporate some of this new information in my African-American survey history class. <clears throat> I actually used the book in, in a Caribbean history class for one semester without incident. I used it in the following semester in an African-American history class, and that's when, as the saying goes, um, all hell broke loose. <clears throat> I used it in the following semester in an African-American history class, and that's when, as the saying goes, um, all hell broke loose. I used the book in, in a Caribbean history class for one semester without incident. I used it in the following semester in an African-American history class, and that's when, as the saying goes, um, all hell broke loose. <clears throat> But before I describe what happened, let me spend a couple, a few minutes summarizing the facts of Jewish involvement in the slave trade. What precisely was the nature of the Jewish involvement in the African slave trade? The Jewish involvement in the African slave trade begins, as far as I can tell, long before the actual slave trade across the Atlantic itself. The transatlantic slave trade has its immediate origins around about 1441, when Portuguese sailors landed on the West African coast and kidnapped a few Africans, brought them back to Europe. Africans were brought back to Europe, to Portugal and to Spain as part of that particular trade for several years. Columbus, of course, arrived in the Americas in 1492, approximately half a century later. In 1502, the first Africans were brought to the Caribbean. The Caribbean is where the transatlantic slave trade begins, and many Americans don't know that. But for over a hundred years before Africans were brought as slaves to this country, the United States of America, Africans were being brought across the Atlantic to the Caribbean, to places like Hispaniola, the island which today is shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic and, and, and to other places as well. So it seems to me that Jewish involvement then in that transatlantic slave trade precedes by many, many years, perhaps by a thousand years, the actual beginnings of the transatlantic slave trade. And let me explain. It seems to me that the most important theoretical underpinning for that transatlantic slave trade was what has come to be known in many quarters as the Hamitic myth. Some people call it the curse of Ham story. When the slave trade developed, beginning in 1441 and for hundreds of years thereafter, people who prosecuted that trade looked around for intellectual justification, for rationalizations, for pretexts, if you want, if you will. And a variety of pretexts were advanced to justify the slave trade, to allow people to sleep well at night, you know, for, for their consciences to be clear. One justification was that Africans were heathens. They weren't Christian, they were heathens. And therefore, it was all right to enslave heathens. It would not be all right to enslave one's Christian brother, but it would be okay. It would be, it would be morally justifiable to enslave a heathen. That was one kind of rationale that was an advance to justify the slave trade. Another rationale was that Africans were less than human. Africans were devoid of reason, could not reason, were a subspecies of, 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 of creature. They weren't human. And therefore, again, whereas there might have been some moral opprobrium attached to enslaving one's fellow human beings. In the case of Africans, since they weren't quite human, that kind of treatment of Africans was okay. The most important, however, of all of these rationales that was advanced to, 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 to try to justify the slave trade was the question of this hermetic myth. That is, the notion that Africans were cursed by God himself that Africans had been cursed by God, that God had decreed in his wisdom a very long time ago that Africans would be forever the hewers of wood and the drawers of water for other races. 
The authority for this idea was said to reside in the book of Genesis, in the story in the book of Genesis. Now, there's a story in the book of Genesis, and there's an interpretation of that story that allowed it to be used to justify African slavery, and they're two different things. The story in Genesis is in Genesis. It's been in the Bible ever since. But the sort of spin that was put on that story that enabled it to become the basis for the Hamitic myth actually comes out of the Talmud, the Jewish holy book, the Talmud. Somewhere around 500 AD or thereabouts, the Babylonian Talmud. Let me just describe the difference between the story as it appears in the Bible and the story as it was spun in the Talmud. According to the Bible, Noah, after the flood, apparently um, had a vineyard someplace, and he partook of the wine that was produced out of his vineyard. He got himself drunk one night, went into his tent, took his clothes off, as people often do when they get drunk. And according to the biblical story, he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham apparently entered the area where his father was lying in his drunken, naked stupor, and Ham, in an act of disrespect, gazed upon his father's nakedness. And apparently went back outside and informed his two other brothers of his father's condition. According to the, to the biblical story, the two other brothers then came in to set inside the tent or wherever. And um, out of respect for their father, they kind of backed into the tent. They would not look directly at him in his naked condition. They backed into the tent. They covered him with some kind of a garment. And according to the biblical story, when Noah revived, when he, you know, arose from his drunken stupor and realized what had happened, he then cursed Ham's son Canaan and all of his descendants forever and said that they would be the servants of the descendants of the other two brothers, Shem and Japheth. Somewhere along the line, I'm not quite sure how come, but somewhere along the line, Somebody came up with the notion that Ham was the progenitor of the African race, and Shem was the progenitor of the Asian race, and Japheth was the progenitor of the European race. So Noah had three sons of three different races, and he cursed his African son and their descendants, and said that those descendants would be the slaves, the servants, of the Asian uh, branch of the family, and also the European branch of the family forever. And that's as far as the biblical story goes. The Talmud, which of course, my understanding of the Talmud, I'm no expert on the Talmud, but my understanding is that the Talmud consists of interpretations, what they call glosses, on, on, on various biblical stories. And these glosses or interpretations or spins um, are supposed to, to give people who subscribe to the Judaic religion a sort of an authoritative guide as to how to interpret the, the biblical stories and whatnot. So what the Talmud did then, the Talmud came along, the Babylonian Talmud, around about 500 or so um, AD, and proceeded to spin this biblical story for reasons that are unknown to me. But Ham, again, was said to be the progenitor of the African race. Now, interestingly enough, I've read someplace that early Christians also um, accepted this notion of, 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 of Ham being some sort of progenitor of the African race. But apparently, in the Christian tradition, the, the kind of, you know, um, overtly racist implications of that fact didn't develop in the same way as it developed in the Judaic tradition. According to the Talmud, um, Ham was, the again, the original African. And when God, through Noah, cursed Ham and his son Canaan and all, and all, his, all his descendants, he was, in fact, cursing the African race. Now, this was the unique new element to the story that the Talmud originated. That the curse on Ham and Canaan was, was not only a curse on an individual and his family, but it was a curse on a race. So, so here, this is the contribution then of the Talmud. That God, through Noah, cursed the African race. And the Talmud proceeded to embellish the story in the most uh, Delightful, should I say, ways. For example, the Talmud said that there was ample proof that God was in fact cursing the African race. It said, for example, that because Ham had gazed upon Noah's nakedness in the dark of night, that uh, the African race was henceforth turned black 
so that the blackness of the African became a sort of a, you know, a, a visible indication of that curse. The Talmud said that because it was dark at night when Ham entered that tent and looked upon his father's nakedness, he had to open his eyes, you know, um, he had to buck his eyes, as they say in America, to, um, to see his father in the darkness. And that's why Africans had big eyes. <laughs> the Talmud said, and here, and I'm going to quote all this exactly in a minute. You know, I'm not making this up. It sounds incredible, but I'm actually paraphrasing a gentleman by the name of um, Harold Brackman. A man who works or worked until recently for the Simon Wiesenthal Center of All Agencies. He wrote all of, all of this in his dissertation. And it might not surprise you to discover that once people like myself began quoting what this guy Brackman wrote, I'm sure you can guess what happened next. And that is that Brackman denied he had ever written this stuff. <laughs> This stuff is in Bachman's PhD dissertation. It's called The Ebb and Flow of History. Anybody here can easily read it. You can get it in any library. If, if they don't have it, they'll get it for you into library loans. It's called The Ebb and Flow of History. It's a PhD dissertation, I think in the history department at UCLA, 1977, by Harold D. Brackman, who I believe up to a couple of years ago, maybe even now, is or was until recently a functionary of the... Um, Simon Wiesenthal, or is it Wiesenthal Center? But despite the fact that his writings are clearly in a public record that anybody, any an undergrad student can access this stuff and check it for themselves, once the story got out, he quickly uh, denied it ever. This, this man actually wrote letters to the New York Times. I believe I have the actual um, you know, so footnotes here in the Jewish one's thought uh, concerning all this. This man wrote letters to the New York Times. He wrote a slew of letters to black publications all over this country, denying all of this stuff, even though it's right there on the record. So I'm, on, you know, using very good evidence here when I paraphrase what he's saying. Brackman tells us that because, and, and, and here it, it gets to be totally uh, hilarious. Now, these Jewish uh, rabbis, the sages, they call them, the wise men who put together this Talmud, they actually invented, I mean, they, they, you know, they, they sort of elaborated on, uh, on, on the biblical story. You know, it's like, like a jazz musician who improvises. Well, they improvise on the story. They did a whole elaborate improvisation in the story. And somehow, Lord knows how come, but they came up with the notion that Ham, when he went into that tent and looked upon his naked father Noah, that Ham buggered his father. He had anal intercourse with his father. And because he had anal intercourse with his father, that's the reason, and here I'm, I'm, I'm citing Blackman, that's the reason why part of the curse was to give black men large uh, sexual organs. So all of this was part of the curse. The black skin, uh, the big eyes, even the kinky hair too, big sexual organs, all of this. So, as amazing as this may seem, this transpired a thousand years before the beginnings of the transatlantic slave trade. And when the slave trade came into being, this notion of the Hamitic curse was revived and it became, both for Jews and for Christians, it became the most pervasive of all the attempts to, to rationalize that slave trade. Let me quote the exact words of Harold Bachman, lest you suspect that I'm making this up. I'm quoting here from Harold Bachman, the dissertation I mentioned a minute ago, The Ebb and Flow of History. Quote, there is no denying, this is on page 34, in case anybody who has a book feels like reading along with me. I know several of you have the book on it. But this is on page 34 in, in, in the middle of the page. Second new paragraph. There is no denying that the Babylonian Talmud was the first source. And listen to how unequivocal he is here. It was the first, the very first. In other words, this is Bachman from the Simon Wiesenthal Center acknowledging that the Talmud was the one, was the, the place that invented the story of the Hamitic uh, curse. There is no denying that the Babylonian Talmud was the first source to read a negrophobic content into the episode 
here he is referring to the episode of Ham looking upon his father's nakedness. He goes on to suggest that these early sages, some of them, you know, uh, sort of um, impose this homosexual uh, sort of spin on the, on the story. Quote, he says, Rab, Rab is one of these sages, he says, Rab maintained that Ham had unmanned Noah. So Ham, according to this sage, had actually castrated his father. While Samuel, Samuel is some other sage, Samuel claimed that he had buggered him as well. Both unmanned him and buggered him. Now how this arose out of the biblical story, um, you know, I'll never understand. <clears throat> Let me continue to quote from Brackman here in his dissertation. Quote, he is discussing here various you know, um, slight, slightly diverging you know, uh, variants of this myth. He goes on to say, quote, the more important version of the myth, that's the Hamitic myth, however, ingeniously ties in the origins of darkness and of other real and imagined negroid traits with Noah's curse itself. According to it, that's according to this uh, most popular version of the Hamitic myth. According to it, Ham is told by his outraged father that because you have abused me in the darkness of the night, your children shall be born black and ugly. This is in a Talmud. Because you have twisted your head to cause me embarrassment, they shall have kinky hair and red eyes. So if you ever wondered about the origin of the kinky hair and the red eyes of black folk, here, here you have it. <clears throat> because your lips jested at my exposure, theirs shall swell. That's why black folks have thick lips. And because you neglected my nakedness, they, that is your children, the children of Ham and Canaan, they shall go naked with their shamefully elongated male members exposed for all to see. So there you have the origin of a whole variety of stereotypes pertaining to African people. So the Hamitic myth then is where you really have to begin, you know, in terms of a discussion of the Jewish role in the slave trade. They provided the rationale par excellence for the prosecution of that slave trade. Some years after the Babylonian Talmud, um, sometime in the Middle Ages, a man who I believe they considered to be perhaps one of the greatest philosophers ever, a man by the name of Maimonides, actually also contributed to that notion of Africans being subhuman when in his famous book, Guide to the Perplexed, Guide to the Perplexed, when he, Maimonides, suggested, again, that African people were less than human, that they were somewhere between monkeys and human beings. This is Maimonides, a man who is one of the most revered of all of these Jewish sages. So by the time then, that the slave trade came along, then, you know, there was this tradition which had been floating around Europe, and it was seized upon then by the slave traders, Jews and Gentiles alike, as a basic rationale. There were other, other areas, you know, in, in, which the, in which the Jewish presence was very manifest. For example, although I don't know a whole lot about this aspect of it, but my understanding is that the Jews were in fact very prominent in the, as slave traders, you know, in the centuries prior to the beginning of the Atlantic uh, slave trade. My understanding is that Jews, you know, for many years sold um, Muslim slaves to, to Christians and sold Christian slaves to Muslims, and they, they were sort of accepted as the slave middlemen by both sides. And this is, you know, a long time before the Atlantic slave trade came, came about. The earliest multinational corporation involved in the Atlantic slave trade was something called a Dutch West India Company. And again, it often surprises people to discover that even in this early period, you know, um, globalization was already a, a, a very, uh, you know, fairly entrenched phenomenon. The slave trade was a great example of globalization. Here you had the Dutch West India Company, out of Holland, of course, which went to West Africa. They had their own private army. They established forts on the West African coast. They had their own... Um, you know, fleet of ships and so on. They had their own administrators. Sometimes they would govern areas. They had their own governors, administrators, and whatnot. They were almost like 
it, it was almost like like colonization, you know, um, you know, via private enterprise. It was like privatized colonization, and all of this, of course, transpired with the sanction of European governments. These were like surrogate governments almost. These um, chartered companies, as they were often called. So the Dutch West India Company in the 1600s then was the pioneer in this kind of multinational globalized prosecution of the slave trade. And apparently a large number of the shareholders, the stockholders in this Dutch West India Company were Jews. The Jews had been chased out of Portugal and Spain. They had been chased out of all kinds of places. They, they found some respite from their wanderings in Holland. They became an influential factor in Holland. And I've seen a variety of figures. This too is an area of some controversy. I've seen estimates varying from 25% to 50% concerning the, 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 the stake of Jewish uh, stockholders in the Dutch West India Company. But suffice it to say that they were an important element in the Dutch West India Company, which was the preeminent entity carrying on the slave trade in the early period. The Dutch West India Company was responsible for, 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 for importing you know, the earliest slaves to places like Brazil, to some parts of the Caribbean, um, either directly or indirectly, I think, to, to this country as well, in, in, a, in a very early period, in, in the 17th century. In many areas in the Americas, Jews were a dominant element in the slave trade. In Brazil, for example, in the 17th century, Jews were a dominant element in, in, in the slave trade. They owned a large number of the plantations. They were often very um, importantly positioned in other aspects, not necessarily the plantation aspects, but things like, say, the importation of slaves, things like the warehousing of slaves, things like the auctioning of slaves, things like the provisioning of slaves, things like manning slave ships, provisioning slave ships. In New England, for example, at the height of, of the um, Atlantic slave trade, rum became a major, a major economic uh, venture in, in New England, places like, like, like Providence, Rhode Island, places like uh, Boston and so on. And rum was a major factor in the slave trade because rum was one of the major items of trade, one of the major uh, items that you know, um, slave ships carried when they went to West Africa to trade and exchange for, for slaves and so on. And I believe that at one point all the rum distilleries in Boston were, were owned by Jews. I think there was something like 18 or something like that rum distilleries. So in all of these areas, both directly and in terms of ancillary um, industries feeding the slave trade, Jews were, 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 were very, very important. Apart from Brazil, Jews were, were again dominant factors in many other parts of the area, for example in Curaçao. Curaçao, a Dutch island in, in the Caribbean, you know, um, the majority of folks involved in the slave trade in Curaçao were, were Jews. At one point in Suriname, which again was a Dutch colony right next to Brazil in South America, Jews were again a very important part of the slave trade in Suriname. There was an English soldier by the name of John Stedman who went to Suriname in the late 1700s as part of a, a mercenary force raised by the Dutch to try to fight against the maroon slaves. Those were the escaped slaves who established an independent existence in the interior and gave the slave regime a lot of trouble. And Stedman wrote a very fascinating book concerning his experiences in Suriname. And there are several references in, in, in uh, Stedman's book to the presence of, of, of Jewish slave owners and so on. There was one large plantation area in Suriname called Jew Savannah. Jew Savannah. And according to Stedman, the Jews were very often the most cruel of the slave owners. They, they played a very prominent role in torturing slaves and so on. Uh, he has several little vignettes that he mentions in there concerning the, the, the kind of uh, cruelties that were meted out to slaves by both Jewish men and women. There's one case he describes there of a maroon slave leader, a man called Jolie Kerr, French Jolie Kerr, be beautiful heart. Don't know where he got that name from, Jolie Kerr. But apparently Jolly Kerr, again, was a, a rebellious slave. He led a slave uprising. And, and on one occasion, apparently, the Maroons were fighting against, you know, some of these people from Jew Savannah. And according to Stedman, they captured a, a Jewish slave owner named Schuss. And apparently Schuss was the man that uh, Jolly Kerr, you know, the slave owner that Jolly Kerr had escaped from as a young boy. And Jolly Kerr remembered that this guy Schultz had apparently ravaged his mother and so on. 
And um, as Tedman describes, very, very, very harsh, harsh uh, vengeance that was uh, wrought by Jolie Care on Schultz. He, uh, he flayed him, cut his skin off, then um, used his, his uh, skin to keep the powder dry, the powder for his cannon or whatever, and used his head to play football with. Uh, Jews were also very prominently uh, present in non-Dutch parts of the Caribbean, places like Barbados, places like Jamaica, St. Thomas, and many of the other islands as well. There's been a big debate that has arisen concerning you know, whether Jews were the dominant uh, element or not, or whether they were even an important element. But much of that discussion has taken place in the context of the United States of America. In the U.S., it may not be correct to say that slaves were as dom that Jews, sorry, were as dominant in the slave trade as they were in parts of, say, the Caribbean or Central America. Nevertheless, Jews were an important part of the slave trade in this country, in the U.S. of A. Anyway, in fact, in the U.S. of A, Jews apparently played a, a role in the slave trade that was greater than their numbers in the overall population would suggest. Just as in 1992. In 1992, a study done based on the Forbes magazine list of the richest people in America for 1992, a study based on that list discovered that something like 33% of the billionaires in the U.S. of A were Jews, based on the Forbes list of 1992, at a time when Jews claimed to be 2.5% of the United States population. So just as in 1992, they were overrepresented in the high echelons of this country, just so during the slave trade, even though the numbers may have been relatively small, and many of the people who have, who have, who have tried to, 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 to refute you know, the suggestion that Jews were prominently involved in the slave trade in this country, many of those people have put forward figures suggesting that Jews were only a very minute portion of the overall American population. Yes, they were a very small percentage of the American population, but that has nothing that has nothing to do with their role in the slave trade, the importance of their role. Their role was much greater than their numbers in the overall population would suggest. As a matter of fact, a Jewish historian has done a study of the 1830 census in the South and has come up with the um, conclusion that something like 75% of Jewish households in the South in this country in 1830 owned slaves, whereas the percentage for white households um, generally, it was only something like 36%. So the Jews were approximately twice as likely as non-Jews, as, as the white population, to own slaves in this country, in the South, in 1830. So again, we're talking here about, you know, proportions rather than absolute figures. Some of the most important slave ship owners in colonial America were Jews. You know, um, perhaps the best known of these is a man called Aaron Lopez. And notice that many of these persons had Spanish or Portuguese sounding last names, and that's because they were Sephardic Jews. When this whole question arose, you know, around my involvement in, in all this, um, many Jews were heard to say that there were no Jews in America prior to the 1880s. In fact, Nathan Glazer, a very famous academic out of Harvard University, who should know better, he actually wrote that there's no way that Jews could be responsible for the slave trade in America, since there were no Jews here, he said, before 1880. Of course, there were European Jews here in the 19th century before 1880, German Jews and so on. But there were Sephardic Jews here um, from the very beginning, you know, from, the, from the 17th century, there were Sephardic Jews coming in here to New York and later to other places. So hence the uh, Spanish-sounding names, names like Nunez, names like Lopez, names like Castro, interestingly enough, names like Ferreira, Herrera, Gomes, Gomez. All of these names, interestingly enough, um, suggested Jewish origin in colonial times. As somebody was saying to me yesterday, you could usually um, get a hint of their Jewishness from their first names. The last, oh, it was you, okay. The last name might be Gomez or Nunez or Castro, but the first name might be uh, Jacob or, or David or something like that, Aaron. So Aaron Lopez was out of Newport, Rhode Island. He was one of the largest slave ship owners in colonial America. This man had a fleet of ships for many years. He sent his ships to West Africa. They traveled from West Africa to the Caribbean, to Barbados, to Jamaica, St. Thomas, places like that. 
He had members of his family situated in, in the Caribbean. He had a whole network going on, and you know, and he brought slaves back here as well. Um, many of his, of his slaves helped to, to build some famous synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, in colonial times. Despite the fact that, oh, by the way, um, Jews were also involved in, in other aspects of the trade. My, my, my time is running out, so I'm going to be quick here. For example, they, they were, they were in, involved again in provisioning slaves here in this country, as they were in other areas as well, you know, providing the kind of coarse cloth that slaves wore, things like that. They um, had a hand in providing the kinds of, of restraints and handcuffs and chains and padlocks and those kinds of things that were used to, 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 to sort of enforce servitude of the Africans as well. Interestingly enough, despite the prominence of Jews in this uh, African slave trade in this country, in the U.S. of A., their prominence in the African slave trade was not matched by a similar prominence in the abolitionist movement. In fact, some of the Christian abolitionists noted this um, apparent contradiction. In fact, let me quote you, quote you here a very interesting uh, statement put out by Christian abolitionists. This is 1853. It's from the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society Report, 1853. Quote, the Jews of the United States have never taken steps, any steps, whatever, with regard to the slavery question. As citizens, they deem it their policy to have everyone choose whichever side he may deem best to promote his own interests and the welfare of his country, etc., etc., etc. This statement concludes as follows, quote, the objects of so much mean prejudice and unrighteous oppression as the Jews have been for ages, surely they, it would seem, more than any other denomination, ought to be the enemies of caste and friends of universal freedom. Such, however, was not the case. There were very few and far between as far as the abolitionist movement was concerned. So this then is the reality of Jewish involvement in the slave trade. And that's the reality that I faced then in 1993 when I stumbled into this controversy simply by exposing my students to the fact that Jews, like everybody else, had been involved. And of course, I did not deny the involvement of anybody else. I did not even deny the involvement of African collaborators. You know, and for years I had taught Christian involvement. And up to now, I'm still somewhat surprised that everybody else, you know, seems willing to acknowledge their involvement in the trade. But for some reason, this is the only group that not only refuses to acknowledge their involvement, but becomes, you know, very, 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 very uh, upset when that involvement is mentioned. I won't have time to go into my particular situation. It's all here in, in, in the Jewish onslaught. Um, I'll just say very briefly before I, ra I wrap up, I was just told I have three more minutes left. But um, this controversy assumed enormous proportions. I'm, I'm still surprised. You know, here was something as simple as my teaching this information, which is all well documented. The book that I was using, The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, put out by the Nation of Islam, that book relies almost 100% on Jewish sources. But what is interesting, though, is that even though the Jewish academics and authoritative sources like the Encyclopedia, <coughs> excuse me, Judaica, even though these sort of academic, esoteric Jewish sources <coughs> were quite forthcoming in acknowledging their role in the slave trade, the popular Jewish uh, press and the popular Jewish populace, I guess, uh, many of them either unaware of all this or refuse to believe it. <clears throat> I remember some Jewish alumni writing into the, <clears throat> to the Wellesley College alumni magazine suggesting that my teaching, you know, the Jewish involvement in the slave trade <clears throat> was akin to suspending the rules of grammar in an English class. <clears throat> <clears throat> The, the end result of all this is that um, <clears throat> the role of Jews in the slave trade, something which was unknown to many folks prior to 1993, something which was largely unknown to me because of the hullabaloo created by the, uh, by the Jewish media and so on, I think that has, in a sense, had an effect that they perhaps did not anticipate. <clears throat> and that is that something which was in fact a secret relationship is no longer secret. The whole world is now aware of the fact, thanks to the hullabaloo created by, by, by the Jewish media, 
of the Jewish involvement in the slave trade. And even though there has been an, an incredible effort since 1993 to, on the part of, of, of the Jewish uh, you know, media to sort of counter-attack, for example, the Amistad movie was part of that counter-attack. The Amistad movie very subtly suggested that Africans were the ones responsible for their own enslavement. <clears throat> the Amistad uh, movie, you know, put on by Steven Spielberg, actually had, actually had an African slave. Imagine this. Steven Spielberg actually had an African slave in the Amistad movie saying, I did not see the movie, by the way, I refused to see it, but I was told that Spielberg actually had an African slave in this movie saying that he was so sorry for the great suffering that, you know, the Jews had, had gone through, you know, and what not, and that nobody in the world, this was an African slave, <clears throat> a man who was on death row, in jail, fighting for his life as an African slave, and Spielberg has this man saying that he had just read the Bible, and these folks have suffered so much, etc., etc. Nobody in the world had suffered as much as they had. <clears throat> the whole question of late of, of an alleged uh, slave trade in the Sudan. Now, there may indeed be a, a Muslim slave trade in the Sudan. There may, and, 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 I, don't, I know, it doesn't you know, bother me one way or the other. But the whole attempt to elevate this into a new great anti-slavery crusade, that too is one of the, the means by which the Jewish establishment has tried to to kind of smother up, smother, cover up, you know, uh, their own involvement in the slave trade. I don't know how many books on, this, on, the, on the slave trade have been published by, by Jews in the last six, seven years. I have lost count, but it, might, it could easily be a, a dozen. You know, they, they keep just churning out these books. But the more noise they make, the more people become aware of the fact that, you know, that there is a Jewish involvement in the slave trade. So I think that to a large extent, I think they have kind of shot themselves in the foot this time around. <clears throat> They have let the genie out of the bottle. I don't know how they'll ever get that genie back in the bottle. I don't think they'll find a way. So let me again end right here by thanking you for giving me this opportunity. And um, thank you, David Irving. <laughs> Professor Martin, how do you ask some questions? Right. <clears throat> thank you very much for Thank you. Thank you. Before we break for the lunch break at 12.30, I'm sure some of you have some questions to ask Professor Martin. I certainly want to ask a general question about proportionality. You yourself preempted the question to a certain extent by referring to the issue of how much greater was the percentage of Jewish involvement in the slave trade than was their actual presence in the population concerned, whether it was in the American population or in the Caribbean or elsewhere. Um, could you give us some kind of estimate. Could you give us some kind of estimate of the involvement, a numerical estimate, just off the top of your head, was it like 10% of in involvement or 20% involvement or 30% involvement? And a, a rider to that question is how certain can we be of the identification of these particular businessmen involved in the slave trade as being Jewish? Um, okay. Just because somebody's name was Aaron, for example, <coughs> would that qualify him as being Jewish, or, or is there a, a clearer definition? And where they, as a third question, did they promote their own interests? Uh, did, did they ensure that the business only went the Jewish way to the Jewish rum manufacturers and, and so on? <coughs> okay, I, I think I'll have to sort of... Um, the proportionality question first. Okay. As far as the proportionality question goes, I think I'll uh, maybe preempt your response to a similar question yesterday, when you were asked about numbers <laughs> as far as the Jewish Holocaust yes. goes. And again, you know, it, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. I haven't done the kind of detailed research into numbers that will allow me to, 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 to really speak with, with any, any kind of authority. <clears throat> Would you say it was a significant proportion? It was significant. Certainly, as I mentioned, um, in some areas, I think it, it, it was, you know, a major element. I can say safely that in Curaçao, in Suriname, in Brazil, in those three places, I think the Jewish involvement would have, would have approximated, would have, would have approached maybe 50 percent, you know, of, of the people involved in, in the slave trade. I think in, in, in Curaçao it might even have been beyond 50 percent. Up to this day, the uh, Jewish population in Curaçao is, is still a, you know, a fairly large element numerically. I think I'm right <coughs> to say that in, that in St. Lucia there's a graveyard exclusively devoted to the Jewish mm -hmm. people who were involved in the slave trade. Yeah, 
um, in Montego Bay, in, in, in uh, Jamaica as well. Yes. There's a big synagogue in Barbados, which I think they refurbished recently, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the statistics that are available have come from Jewish sources themselves. For example, the uh, statistic I mentioned about something like 75% of Jewish households in the South having yes. slaves, as opposed to 36% of, of, of white households. That comes from a, a, Jewish, um, a, a Jewish historian. And he went back to the census, and he did the kinds of things that you were hinting at. Yes. Now, even, even for a Jewish historian, as you mentioned yesterday, yes. the Jews themselves aren't sure what a Jew is and who is a Jew. Yes. But, but, but in so far as he could plausibly ascertain, you know, from names and from other kinds of evidence. Indicators. Yes, yes. But, um, but, but of course, there's no way he, there was no way he could be 100% certain. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Um, Do you think the, 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 the Jewish community harmed their cause by trying to pretend this never happened? Or would they be, do better to be perfectly open and frank about it and say those times are behind us and we would never do it again? Yes, I think that would have been the most sensible thing to do. Acknowledge it the same way that everybody else has done and let's move on. But by trying to create an issue about it, I think that they, they, they forced themselves into an indefensible position. Do you think that the Jewish community representatives like the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Anti-Defamation <coughs> League and the Benai Brits should apologize to the black African community of this country for the, for the injury they inflicted on them. But I actually call for an apology and reparations in the Jewish onslaught. Yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> well, I understand they have the money to pay the reparations. If they're <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've recently come into quite a, a large inheritance, I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, does anybody else have a, have a question to put to Professor Martin? <clears throat> Do you think David Brinkley could have kept his job and answered otherwise? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Do you have a, an idea of the percentage of slaves that were imported to America versus Brazil, South America, Caribbean, etc.? I've heard that uh, of the entire slave trade that America itself only got a very low percentage of the, of the number. I, I'm not sure if North America got a low percentage, but I think it's generally acknowledged that, that Brazil was the place that absorbed the majority of, of the Africans. And I believe up to today, I think Brazil actually has the largest African population of any place in the Americas. In fact, some people argue that Brazil has the second largest African population of any country in the world after Nigeria. Of course, the, 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 there's a, a great complexity uh, around racial, you know, um, designations in Brazil. Yeah. Professor Martin, yeah? do you think that this uh, problem of slavery mm -hmm. also reflects upon the um, failure of moral nerve of the Christian society in which the Jews then operated? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what in other words, the fact that they they got away with all this, mm -hmm. it also reflects on the Christian society, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and therefore uh, we can't only blame the Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, nothing was done about it. Well, I, I don't think anybody has ever attempted to blame only the Jews. Um, I certainly have never attempted to blame only the Jews. My position all along has been that other groups have acknowledged their involvement. So what is so special about the Jews that, um, that they are beyond academic inquiry? That has been my position. Of course, many of the Jewish people have accused people like myself of, of arguing that the Jews were exclusively responsible for the trade. Because what they have tended to do, because their position is so indefensible, what they tend to do is to ascribe to people like myself, you know, a, a, a totally off-the-wall uh, position, in, in other words, they create a man of straw, then they attack that man of straw. But that man of straw is saying things that I never said. For example, they claim that people like myself were suggesting that Jews were um, genetically predisposed towards enslavement, you know, and they, but I never said anything like that. But they find it much more comfortable to attack what they claim you say than what you actually said. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.